Hi, everyone. Just want to welcome you again to Mathematics for the Inpatient with Stan. Uh, today on the show, we are going to talk about oracles. Big question of the hour. They're super important, um, something that everyone needs to know about, and especially important not just for DeFi, but all sorts of other applications. So let me start this off with some basic questions. Stan, can you tell us what, what's the definition of an oracle? Why, you know, why are why are oracles important to blockchains? And I think importantly, why are oracles used in a lot of modern dApps? Yeah, that's kind of a really interesting question. And believe it or not, Marcus, but many people use oracles, even though they don't know they use them. I have many friends that tell me, oh, there is this DeFi application, that DeFi application, I can make this money, I can make that money. People are trying to make money in DeFi. In many cases, they don't really understand how the things work and how actually Oracle actually fit the picture. So an Oracle is something that provides information to the blockchain uh, from the outside world. Historically, when Satoshi Nakamoto designed the first blockchain, Bitcoin, blockchains were designed in a passive way, in a sense that a blockchain by itself can, can never go and retrieve information about the outside world doesn't know what's happening around. And so if you want to actually be able to bring information to the blockchain, you design something which is called an Oracle. And the simplest application of an Oracle is something which is called collateralized loans or collateralized DeFi. That's very much things like, you know, someone has lots of money, someone has lots of tokens in kind of strange exo exotic tokens. Let's say I have a million dollars in this very strange, very speculative exotic token. And I hold this token. And then you, Marcus, you have $100,000 in USD, USDC or USDT in a stable coin, which is totally stable and, and totally you know, reasonable. Then I come to you and I say, Marcus, I have $1 million in this very strange, very speculative token. Can you lend me $100,000 in your USDC or USDT? And I'll pay you really, really good return of invest investment. I'll pay, pay you maybe like 20% annual return rate in USDC. And you may think, well, that's, fun that's fantastic. You know, Stan is giving me this $1 million in this token as a collateral. And then what I need to do, just give him $100,000 he needs to see, and it'll make 10% annual return rate or 20% annual return rate. What may happen though, is that my token is very, really exotic and it may crash. So although I provided to you a uh, million dollars in tokens as a collateral and you loaned me only 100,000, you, you can lose all of your money just because the value of my token, the collateral can actually crash to zero. So when it crashes, you know, you're trying to sell it and don't, you're not gonna make even $100,000. In this example, you understand that when you take collateral in return for a loan, you really have to be careful because the value of the collateral can fluctuate. And the Oracle is supposed to report to the blockchain the actual value of the collateral. And when the value drops below a certain value, it's supposed to go to sell collateral. So basically, you know, I'm giving you a million dollars, but the smart contract on the blockchain says, okay, if this value drops below $500,000, you know, sell it. And that's, that's a way to protect you for, to save your $100,000 that you actually loaned to me. So that, that's pretty much the story. And it repeats uh, and repeats and repeats itself. And if you look at blockchain now, at Ethereum, other blockchains, you'll literally see tens of billions of dollars in these collateral schemes where people take very speculative, very exotic tokens, and they get real money in return in terms of USDC and USDT. And there are oracles, these information providers, that actually provide information to the blockchain. And when the value of the collateral drops below a certain value, the Oracle is supposed to tell it to the blockchain and the, the blockchain is supposed to sell the collateral. So that's pretty much the, the, the Oracle and that's how it's used. It's a very critical part of the blockchain infrastructure. Very cool. So, you know, I wanna kind of dive in a little bit, um, a little bit deeper. So maybe if you could tell us 
how do oracles work? You know, so what's the sort of like the the functioning of um, functioning of an oracle? And I think as a part of that, what are the limitations of some of the current generation of oracles? Right, that's a really great question, Marcos. And I'm, I, I want to come back to this picture, to this uh, picture of uh, collateral and loans because that's really what's happening now on the blockchain. So, so the way oracles work currently, they work in a very simple way. There are some computers, there are some projects that put computers on the internet. And these computers take information from the world and push it as streams. Every, say, every minute, every 10 minutes, they push it to the blockchain, say, Ethereum blockchain. So an example of collateral loan, let's say I have my exotic token, and then uh, your security depends on Oracle, and the Oracle, say, every 10 minutes or every 30 minutes, pushes to the Ethereum blockchain, information on how much my collateral is worth. And then if my collateral drops below a certain value, the smart contract will get this information uh, from Oracle and, and actually sell the collateral. So the Oracle is very simple. It's very simple compu computer program that every 10 minutes, every 20 minutes, every hour takes information. In most cases, in this information is, is the price of the token and pushes this price to the blockchain. When the price is on the blockchain, the smart contract keeps on monitoring this price. And then when the price drops below the certain value, it's supposed to sell the collateral. So that's really how Oracles works. So Oracle, Oracles, the, the current generation of Oracle, Oracles are not actually part of the blockchain. They separate projects that actually push information into the blockchain. And the problem that happens with the current generation of Oracle is that let's say, let's say you know, something really bad happens, the market crashes, the panic starts, you know, people start selling things, prices start fluctuating hugely. At this moment, when there is this bad, bad situation happening, when the price of the tokens goes down, the oracles are supposed to actually push this information to the blockchain, and the smart contracts are supposed to say, start selling to actually save money of people. But because at this very moment, there's usually huge panic, there's so many transactions going on, oracles actually may not be able to even push information to the blockchain. And we've seen this year already the situations when the price drops on the market, panic starts, or lots of movements, movements start on the market, and oracles are trying to push information to the blockchain. The blockchain is totally congested. And then what's happening is essentially chaos. You know, you loaned your $100,000 to me. I, I gave you this oracle, which, which this token, which now costs zero. And you lose your money because the, the Oracle is not able to provide information to the smart contract and the smart contract is not able to sell. So essentially it goes random and chaotic. And the very reason for this is because the Oracle is not part of the blockchain, it's an external entity. It is, and it's not guaranteed that the Oracle will be able to push information to the chain. And guess what? At the very moment when you need the Oracle, at the moment of this market panic of the crash, the Oracle is actually not able to function. So that's really the problem with the, the problem with the Oracles, how they work today. They work fine when things are good and you don't need them. But when things are actually bad and you need them to work, then that's where when you have really, really problems with these things operating. Interesting. And yeah, I should note that collateral, collateralized loans are really just one example of mm -hmm. how this works. There's lots of other examples mm -hmm. in, in all sorts of different industries, uh, you know, outside mm -hmm. of DeFi that people mm -hmm. can use this. So, so important thing to note. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the, um, you know, scales approach um, mm -hmm. you know, to, to oracles, uh, you know, how they work and, and, you know, how are, how are the, how are, how will a scale Oracle, um, you know, work better than, than some of the existing solutions? This, that's a great question, Marcus. And uh, you're totally correct. You know, there are many, many different examples of how Oracles can be used. I just kind of started with this kind of very dramatic example of authorized <laughs> loans, because that's where the actual, you know, the, uh, the currently when Oracles are deployed, but they can be used for many different uh, applications. You know, there are the DeFi applications, for instance, there are prediction markets where you can actually bet on the weather, or you can bet whether a particular president, candidate becomes a president, there are all kinds of things. 
Yeah. But you know, if you look at the usage today, collateralized loans actually probably you know the most of the usage. But there may be other things in the future uh, how oracles may be used. Now at scale, we when we looked at this problem, we understood that oracles do have this problem. You know, when you want to use them, when you need them the most, they may fail. We decided to build a very different architecture. So in case of scale, first the Oracle is actually part of scale. It's, it's not an outside entity. It's something which we are building into the blockchain. So because it's built into the blockchain, it's guaranteed to work. Scale blockchain, scale Oracle will be as embedded into scale blockchain as the blockchain itself. So if blockchain, if scale blockchain works, scale Oracle will actually work too. So that's number one. It's embedded, it's part of the system. It's not an outsider. And number two, which is also really important, it's not done by actually periodically feeding information to the blockchain because this thing that is, does not scale, right? Imagine that you have so many things about the world, right? So you can't just keep on feeding the entire information about the world into the blockchain because the blockchain will just get, you know, a little bit too much information. You only need the information that the particular smart contract needs at a particular moment in time. So instead of constantly pushing all kinds of information to the blockchain, including information which is not needed, you will only uh, push into the blockchain information which is needed at a particular moment. Mm. The way it's done is when uh, a Ethereum client, say MetaMask, right? MetaMask is probably the mostly used Ethereum wallet, Ethereum client, right? When At the moment when MetaMask pushes a transaction into scale blockchain, if a particular piece of information is needed, at this very moment, uh, scale nodes will all go and retrieve this information and add this uh, into, to the transaction. And the information will be signed using a threshold signature. So in ex let's take an example. Let's take an example where you want to I, loan me some money and you want to know if this particular trans during this particular transaction, if what's the price of my of my token. So when when MetaMask goes to scale blockchain and is about to execute a transaction, submit the transaction to scale blockchain, uh, what's going to happen is that scale nodes at this very moment will all each of them every node in scale blockchain will go to the outside world and retrieve a particular piece of information let's say this information is price of a particular token or weather or whatever so every node goes to the outside world and retrieves this information but now what's important is that we cannot try it trust a particular node in scale blockchain. They can only trust a super majority. So then what happens after each node retrieves the information, the nodes vote and we require a super majority, a two thirds super majority of nodes to sign information. So let's, if, if that's the price of the token, then, you know, uh, out of say 16 nodes, uh, all of them go to the outside world. Each of them retrieves information. And then let's say they vote and 11 of them agree that this is the price of the token and they sign and they use this threshold signature, the BLS signature that we discussed during the previous sessions. Essentially, it's a way for a group of nodes to collectively sign on information. So then you have this threshold signature which tells you that it's not only that the price is this, but it also tells you that the super majority of scale nodes in a particular blockchain agreed to this and they signed the statement. So the statement becomes a collective statement, all, all of these guys. And then in, the, in this very moment, you actually include the statement in the transaction and then the statement goes into the blockchain. That's why it's dynamic. It's dynamic because the information is not fed into the blockchain. It's actually retrieved at the very moment when it's needed and the nodes sign the information and then the information actually becomes part of the transaction and it's used uh, by the smart contract. So at the very moment when the smart contract needs this information, the information is passed to it as part of the transaction and there's no time lag. So instead of, you know, 
pushing information every 10 minutes and then worrying that the information may actually change during these 10 minutes. We're actually pushing information as part of the transaction exactly at the moment when this information is needed. This actually makes scale Oracle much better than anything else. And also we can retrieve any information. Any transaction can take anything. You know, you can be any, you can actually get anything you wish. You can go and retrieve weather, you can retrieve a particular financial information, anything. For every particular transaction, you can actually go to any website anywhere in the world and retrieve, re retrieve any piece of information. It's totally dynamic and it doesn't require any feeds and also doesn't, doesn't actually spam blockchain. If you don't need this information, uh, you, you actually won't need it, won't actually push it into the blockchain. Only, only the information which is needed is actually pushed into the blockchain and there's no time lag. And it's also part of the scale blockchain. So that's pretty much the, the idea of scale dynamic Oracle. And that's what scale engineering is working on currently. We already have a prototype of the Oracle uh, as an alpha uh, version. We're working really, really hard to make this Oracle as uh, available as soon as possible. And definitely it's gonna make it in the next uh, version of, of scale product, uh, of, of, of the, the next release, because there are many, many, many people that ask us about Oracles. And we just decided to do this Oracle feature as good as possible because it critically helps people to be secure as I described in this example of a collateralized loan. Very cool, very cool. Excellent, well, today was Oracles. Um, I wanna invite everyone to join our Twitter at Scale Network. Um, we are actually currently in New York at the Masari Conference. So um, if you are here in New York, please uh, you know, come visit. Also scale.network, our website, you can post questions um, below in the YouTube. Thanks, Dan. Okay, Marcus.